Welcome to the Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners podcast. You will hear about industry insights with award-winning financial planner and entrepreneur, Jason Pereira. Through the interviews with different experts with their stories and advice, you will learn how you can navigate the challenges of being an entrepreneur, plan for success, and make the most of your business and life. And now, your host, Jason Pereira. Hello and welcome. Today on the show, I have Jamie Hopkins, Managing Partner of Wealth Solutions at Carson Group. Jamie's a well-known personality in the U.S. financial advisory space and recently published a book called Find Your Freedom, Financial Planning and Life Purpose. And I brought him on the show today to specifically talk about that book, what he hoped to accomplish with it, and how the lessons from it can help you think about your retirement and the rest of your life. And with that, here's my interview with Jamie. Jamie, good to see you. Jason, great to see you too. And uh, thanks for having me on the show here today. Uh, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it's either that or I just Twitter troll you nonstop. So one or the other. All right. So Jamie Hopkins, tell us about yourself. Yeah. So uh, tell me about myself. That's, always, that's a good way to phrase it. So we'll start. Where will we start today? I'll start with my dog because, you know, he was barking. I locked him up. So I, I am a dog owner and lover. I've got Baxter, who's a labradoodle. He's fantastic. He's wandering around elsewhere in the house right now. Uh, father of three, husband, and try to still be a runner. I don't run as much as I used to. We might get into a little bit of that. Uh, where I sit now from a work perspective, I work at a, a company called Carson, and we're a national RIA, and I oversee uh, Carson Wealth and uh, Wealth Solutions. And really, that's our financial planning and uh, financial planning offering for individuals in the United States. So it's uh, really rewarding. I mean, I think that the advisory world and helping people with their money and the meaning that they find in life is a super noble profession. It's not about the dollars, but it's about what you can do with them. It's a means. And that's what I get to do every day. And I love that. And I hope that the rest of my life, I get to work in this space somewhere. And I feel really blessed about that the last couple of weeks as we've kind of watched the banking crisis and other things that have occurred in the US and just knowing that we're kind of sitting there helping people with those conversations and making sure that their cash and their well-being is taken care of. Yeah, a uh, scary time for many, no doubt with that. And I'm sure even the most solid plans, people are still, and I know from experience, even the most solid plans, people are still going to ask questions just out of concern and fear. So I brought you on, on the show today because you basically published a book recently called uh, Find Your Freedom, Financial Planning for Life on Purpose. So Talk to me about what inspired you to basically write this book. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the inspiration. I'll tell a little story here that for anybody who has written a book or thought about it will feel really painful. And it was painful. <laughs> so I set out, actually, when I, I've, this is my, to some degree, my eighth book, really my second consumer book, though, I think that I'm, I'm proud of. But when I started this one, I started writing a book and I got about what I would say is halfway through my outline. I outline books before I start. I got about halfway through and I started reading it and I sent it to a friend of mine. And I was just like, this, it feels really bad. Like it's not good. And it was really boring. Now, that's not a, probably a good thing when you want to publish something and say, hey, my book's really boring. And that's like the quote you put on the front. Like, this is a really boring book. And that's how I felt. And honestly, I was writing it like a textbook. And I was trying to break down my view of what true financial planning is or what financial planning should feel like to a consumer. And it just ended up like I was teaching financial planning to a CFP professional. And that's how the book was turning out. So I actually just... And then I was debating, do I just finish it and live with the product? Do I try to transform this into something else? And I ended up just scrapping it. So I have half of a written book that just scrapped. And so I restarted it and I, I started kind of kicking around like, okay, what should it be instead? Because you just get so stuck on here's my, my mental view and my outline and here's where I'm going to end up with the book. And I just couldn't move it. And so eventually it came up as a conversation with Ron about, well, you should write more about this, this term freedom. And what does freedom mean to you? We, we asked that a lot at Carson. And so I started down that path and it's really completely different. The whole first half of the book is about finding meaning, finding purpose. What does freedom mean to you? Writing your eulogy, looking at values, getting beyond goals to aspirations. I mean, that's the first half of the book. The second half of the book then goes back to, well, how does financial planning help you get there? Because we live in that, that world of needs, wants, and wishes, and that if we don't take care of our needs, we don't have a house, we don't have food, we don't have security, 
we can't move up to the aspirational aspects of things, right? If you're living on the street and you just need to figure out where your next meal is, you're not worried about climbing Mount Everest, right? Like that's not on your list of things to do that day. It is, I need to find food. And that's overly exaggerated, but it is reality. As we move through, you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we have to take care of those basic level of financial planning, cash inflow, budgeting, debt management before we can move on to more complex financial planning pictures and strategies. So that's really the second half of the book walks through that part. And then some stuff that probably isn't normally in a financial planning type of book. Like I talk a lot about community and a lot of people have told me that's been their favorite chapter is I just talk about what is the role that community plays basically in your financial life. And that's one that I've spent even more time thinking and talking about since I put the book out because it's, I don't know that you can find another book where community is a core part of like the financial planning book. So that's a little bit unique. So we put the book out and it hit a Wall Street Journal bestseller, which has been great and still doing a little bit of promotion around it and kind of pushing it out there. But if you go back to the real question, I know I've been talking for like five minutes, but this is what You're I do. It's all been good. And I got lots to ask you about after. Yeah. But I, I got to answer the other part too, though, right? Is what is, right? What was the inspiration for this one? The reality is the inspiration for this book, like my reason for being in this profession is my family. My dad passed away when I was eight. My mom then raised us and, and built up opportunities for us, which were tremendous. So that aspect of my life, those early relationships that I developed with money are my driver for all of this. I mean, that's why I wrote this book was also to give people permission to, if you come from a place of trauma or abundance or wherever you came from, that that's okay, that you shouldn't feel shame and living a life of well-meaning and financial freedom. And you shouldn't feel shame if you're coming from a place of scarcity and a negative mindset. And that if you don't feel free today, that's also okay. That everybody is not going to feel a 10 out of 10 on the freedom level and security. And that giving people permission to feel that way, but then to take action is really where I want the book to play a role. Fair enough. And it's, um, you know, as a side note, I will say that uh, your origin story there in terms of your background is interesting because, I mean, one of the things I find very common amongst people who've gotten into the planning profession in general is some form of financial difficulty in their personal lives growing up. But that scarcity affects us all. Some of us manifested into solving that problem for ourselves and others. So uh, not surprising, very, very common. But thank you for sharing that. So you said a number of incredibly interesting things there that I want to really unpack. And I think what I will say with your approach is it looks like you did the old Simon Sinek start with why, right? Starting with why, which which frankly is at the end of the day, money returns alpha, whatever term we use, right? At the end of the day, that is all in service of purpose. And you know, that's that's where you started, which makes a lot of sense. But you mentioned writing your eulogy. I, I want to unpack that. Talk to me about what you mean by that. Yeah. So literally, we challenge people to write their eulogy. How would that read today? And in a document that we, we reference in here that you can grab online if you Google it, we have something called blueprinting that we do at Carson. And you can just literally Google Carson Group and blueprinting guide and you'll be able to grab it and download it. It's pretty long. So a lot of people don't go through the whole thing in one sitting, but you could grab the eulogy part and write it out. And it's a really powerful thing because it really questions whether or not you're living life within your values, whether you're doing the right things today. Like, would people write in your eulogy that like, you know, I'll use myself today. Like my kids would probably write today. Dad works too much. He loves working and he travels all the time and we wish he was home more. Right. Like that would probably be part of my eulogy if my kids wrote it today, which is probably not where you want to live your whole life. Now I'm making some of those decisions today and trade-offs and I know that I'm making them and my wife and I have discussed them, but it's who do you want to be? What life do you want to live? How do you want to be remembered? There is a story that sometimes I use around this too, which I think it was St. Ign Ignatius of Loyola, but I could have gotten the saint wrong. I'm, it's been a long time since I checked that, but some saint story. So we'll just go with that. And you have this kind of, younger monk that goes out to search out for this person. He's in it's a monastery and they say, hey, you know, where's the saint? He goes into the back and finds the saint in the garden. And he asks him all these questions about life and meaning and God and faith. And then he gets to this point where he says, if you found out the world was ending and judgment day was today, like, what would you go do? And it's such a powerful question, right? Mm -hmm. And he just says, finish this row, right? <laughs> like, that's it. And I like, I've always remembered that 
And it's been a powerful story to me because are you doing today the, the things you want to do if you knew this was the last day of your life? And if you would change your whole life, if that was the case, it probably means you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> and I challenge people to write that down. Write down who you want to be. Write your eulogy as if you passed away today. And is that the life you want to leave behind? Is that living a life on purpose? Absolutely. So let's go back to the concept of financial trauma, because we touched upon that quickly. And I want you to kind of share with us about how people's upbringing around money can really impact the way they see the world around money going forward in their adult life. Early childhood development is a lot more impactful than we probably give enough credit for. And so I mean by that, if you start looking at the research about development of our brain, development of our relationships, our drive, how we relate to money, it forms a lot earlier than you would expect it to. So that's one piece of things is just kind of recognizing the fact that, look, we develop really early in our lives, the way that our brain is going to react to things. And it's really hard to change that later on. Um, it becomes harder and harder to change people's behavior. We actually have to change the environment or the situational factors around them to then develop actual change. So we get developed really early on, which means later on when we actually have to figure out how we're going to do financial planning and relate to money, it is a really helpful exercise to go back and explore our early relationships with money or our first money memories. Now, I'm going to tell a story that's not in the book, but it's tied to the book because it's stuff that has occurred since I wrote the book and published it, which was I talk about my first early, it's probably not my very first, but my early impact on that scarcity, my dad passing away, he was the person who made the money, he did construction, went up on a job site, was doing gutters at that time in his life. And, uh, you know, we lived in Baltimore and it was raining and then it temperatures dropped aluminum ladder froze over. And when he was coming down that ladder, he slipped and fell and broke his neck and passed away that day, right? Like, you know, so I went to school that day as an eight-year-old with a dad and a mom, they're running their own construction company and came home that day with without my dad. And I remember where I was when I have found out in the kitchen that he passed away and, and nobody even said anything to, like, that's one of those things that I just super remember. I saw the truck come home because I was told, hey, he was in an accident. So it's an eight-year-old, like the only accidents I really thought about were car accidents. And I remember seeing the truck from my bedroom window pull into the driveway. And I was like, hey, the truck looks fine. So like, he's probably okay, right? And so I went down stairs and we had a like spiral staircase down to the kitchen. And uh, like, I just remember getting there and you could see everybody and like, you just knew like it wasn't okay. And so like, to me, that whole next time period was just uncertainty. And I mean, as an eight-year-old, you know that like my dad's the one that goes and does the work. So there isn't somebody to do that. Therefore, there's no money. And like the family unit is at risk. And so I talk about that in the book and that kind of fear that it created in me. Now, the interesting part about that is so my mom, who then continued to run the company, she still runs the company today. I talk about a lot of those things. You know, she's never had a 401k. She never worked for other people. So she didn't have kind of the employer side benefits. She's been running her own construction business for 30 some years now. And, you know, has done really well and gave me and my sisters all these opportunities. And so I probably overly focus on the book on the, the scarcity part of that, because that's the part that really changed me from my view on money. But my mom's book would be more of a success book if I actually wrote one about her, right? That she's overcame all this and provided all this and like super amazing. So she feels the book is too negative. So I will I will give her that <laughs> point. Um, <laughs> But that's the really interesting conversation that my mom and I have had since we wrote the book is that her experience around this, obviously still filled with trauma, did not change her perception and relationship with money, right? And I like if I do a different version of this or whatever later on, I'm going to talk about that, which she'll also probably is you know, not her favorite thing is not me talking about our family <laughs> on everything. But it's a super interesting dynamic that this was a super traumatic time period and it did impact my mom and she was super worried right at the beginning. But then she knew and believed in herself and her ability to earn money and she knew that she was going to take care of our family and be successful. Well, the reality is like her formation with money started when she was a kid and she watched her dad, who was also an entrepreneur running a company, be successful and be able to grow a construction company over time too and lived in that world. So her mindset was, I've got to do this because right? My spouse passed away and I've got to be able to run with this. But that being said, it wasn't her first money memory. It didn't change her relationship with money. Now for me, 
I didn't know those things. I didn't have a different view. I wasn't formed with watching my grandfather build a, a business at some other port period of time. My view was the person who makes the money is gone. And so I left that with more trauma around money than she did, even though we had the same right experience, our relationship and impact of that was completely different. And I find that to be incredibly interesting, right? That you can have the same experience, but because the time period and your other experiences were different, the outcome of that was the complete opposite. Hers is then a story about perseverance and knowing what she can go build. And mine created a sense of scarcity and fear around that that my mom didn't have. And I I found that to be super interesting. I mean, it ties to all of this, which is those early experiences are super formative. And so Mm -hmm. if you go through that scarcity one, you will behave in ways like that later on. And the more you explore this, the more you'll start to understand about your why and how you behave towards money. Hmm. Powerful stuff. And it, it makes a lot of sense too. I mean, like, her dynamic was formed around a successful entrepreneur and the work that needed to be done in order to become secure. Yours was based around insecurity at the time. So, I mean, it's right. It's, it's a very different point of view, even though you went through the same experience at the same time. It's just the background was, the, her background stuck with her, right? And and kept her going. So that is, uh, thank you so much for sharing that story, both in the book and, and personally. So yeah, I mean, it's, I, and oftentimes one of our favorite questions about to clients, not necessarily right off the bat, but in early on is, asking them about what money was like growing up, because that just gives us so much insight. If there was a trauma there, it was like a deep breath and an opening up and almost like letting this out. And I've also found, and tell me if you see the same thing, I found that that level of insecurity leads to typically a need for, for degrees of safety that oftentimes make it difficult to complete a plan. So for example, the constantly moving the goalposts. Mm-hmm. I had several entrepreneurs in the past say, okay, I need to get to this and I think I'm comfortable. And then, you know, you meet with them two years later, yeah. they're there and suddenly it's $2 million larger. And you're like, okay, come on, your, your lifestyle hasn't increased. What other manifestations do you think you see? Like it, it, that's just, just one example there. Yeah, well, th- I mean, that's a great one. And I talk about that in the book too. It's also like, you know, there's never enough if that's what you're chasing, right? Like what's enough? Well, there's never enough. And so if you focus on a dollar number, and I wrote this in my other book too, in Rewirement, that if the focus is on an amount of money you need to save, there isn't enough money. There just isn't, right? Like you can go to the richest person in the world and they're still trying to save and accumulate more. That will never go away. So instead for people who really feel free about money, you actually have to get beyond that part and you have to start to focus on, right, what are the things you want to accomplish and the way you want to live your life? Then all of a sudden, the money just becomes a means towards that and you can get over some of that trauma or scarcity. Now, Ron talks a little bit about this in the book too. And he's talked about this publicly, so I'm not sharing any of his deep, dark secrets uh, that he hasn't shared already. Ron's done super well financially over the course of his life now, right? And like, that's not a, it's not a secret secret. either. He's done well. He's built a really good business. He's built a a, a over a billion dollar valuation in a business that he started in his dorm room, right? Like, I think that's such an amazing story too. And sometimes it gets lost. Like he's built a billion dollar valuation firm from his dorm room originally. He picked up the yellow pages and started making calls from his dorm room. And that's a super inspiring story. Now, up until super, like very recently within the last couple of years, Ron has always felt, though, because he went through the experience of his parents going bankrupt, that even though he became very secure and honestly past the point where he was going to run out of money, still felt like he could go bankrupt. And he lived like he didn't like debt. He didn't use debt. He never borrowed. He was against all of that because he had that feeling. And he only recently kind of said he got to the point where he was like, look, I, I always felt like I could run out of money. And, you know, this is a very successful person that, in all honesty, probably wouldn't run out of money. But he's kept that feeling until take a he, lot of work for him to run out of money. I'm just yeah, like it, like <laughs> like it'd be really like you you'd have to right you'd have to you know get well, that's, that's the line big. I give people all the time yeah. right I'm not picking on Ron in particular gambling and you'd have yeah, to, you'd have to go that route right like <laughs> you have to go this absurd route like where like you're just literally throwing just absurd sums around for no good purpose right and that and the problem is is that like not the problem but those people after so long you can't have that concern and worry and save. And then at some point, just let go. Like, it's like you have flexed muscle that's now mm-hmm. completely cramped and you cannot, you cannot unstress that. Yeah. And Ron's 
didn't come from really changing his view on money. It ch- came from changing his view on the impact and where he wanted to spend his time, mm. right? So he went from wanting to be business owner, advisor to wanting to impact, right? Child hunger and clean water. And it was more so through that work of kind of figuring out who I am and where my true values and impact are going to be that he then felt like, wow, like I now have the ability to actually use my money for these purposes versus just accumulating stuff. Because again, if the focus is on accumulating, there isn't enough, right? Like there, you can't get to an end number. It doesn't top out. But yeah. when you can start thinking about the impact you can have, you're like, wow, this is pretty meaningful. And so that's been a really, I've known Ron for, what is it now, 16, 17 years. And he's gone through an amazing journey being able to watch him. And, you know, we were, we've been closer in the last five years than we were in the early part. But even in the last five years, getting to, getting to learn from Ron and be part of that journey with him has been wonderful. Excellent. <sighs> I feel like every time he's heard talking, there's more to unpack with it. Now, I want to, <laughs> I want to turn, you know, because being cognizant of the time, I want to turn to the area you said that was unique and was not, you know, people have said they really love, which was the community aspect. Talk to me about the approach you took and what you were trying to, what you were trying to explain about the importance of community. Community is such an important aspect of our lives in the world. And there's great books and research and experts just on the aspects of community. And so I pretty basically touch on it. But this notion of community, when I when I have time in my life to actually take a deep breath and think about probably three or four topics, this is one that's just really embedded on my mind. It, sometimes we use the term culture too, but like what is the community that you have in your job, your local community, your family community? I've also, I'm sure somebody else has talked about this too, but I talk about like unintended communities or accidental communities. I use that term a lot. And those are communities we just kind of like fall into. They're not purposeful. I'll use a a simple example of this, which is like super, I don't know, biased or sexist or whatever too, but it's just like guys go to college, they might end up in a fraternity or sports team. You continue down that route with that group because you were there. They existed the same time you were. You might not have even picked them. It might've been because of the floor you ended up in your college dorm room. And that became your community. Now, I call that an accidental community. Now, you might have loved that community, but you might have stayed in that community past where it was beneficial to you. And all of a sudden, you're hanging out with those guys and they're still drinking, they're partying, they're gambling, and you're in your 40s and you're spending a lot more money. That's putting a stress on your work, your finances, and your home. Now, there are people who fall into that, right, out there in the world today. And that's an accidental community that you could be purposeful about how does that impact your life. And those can be really hard to change and pull yourself out of. You also get accidental communities like your family, like you didn't pick your family, you were born into it. Now, that's there are less options you have there, but there are still ways, and I talk about in the book, that like you can put up parameters around how you want to engage even with your family. And if you have unhealthy aspects of your family that are negative for your finances, you can put parameters in place. I talk about gifting a lot in there and my family's not unhealthy on it, but I think I do run into people that say, oh, I've got all these siblings and nieces and nephews and we all buy them Christmas presents and it puts financial stress back on you. Set different parameters. Say we're not going to do that. We're going to buy one present and that's all for the holidays. You can set healthy parameters for yourself even inside your communities. And then I think the last part of that is when you think about your financial world, like are you picking communities that are helping push you into positive financial behaviors and being purposeful and intentional on that. And then thinking about the role that you play in communities is another one. That's the one that for me personally has changed the most over time is I think a lot of our early communities, we end up accidentally in and we don't think about our purposeful role in that community. You play on the team, it's your neighborhood, it's your city it's your church, whatever it is, you just kind of end up in it. And whatever you were doing is then your role versus being super purposeful. It's my job to be a good follower and I commit to the community. Is it to change the community? Is it to welcome others into the community, right? Whatever it may be, is it to lead the community? And you can find different roles if you're purposeful on it. And I think that's a really interesting way to look at the world, our money and communities. And then I'll close with this one. Community has this super positive connotation, right? When you hear the word community, we're all like, hey, 
And part of this is pointing out that there are really negative aspects of community too, where a lot of other areas I have to point out like debt, there's positive parts of debt. This is one where I'm like, hey, community is really important, but it can also be very negative and draining and it can subtract from your life if you're not purposeful on it. Yeah, I mean, it's you're right. There's an inherent positive bias to the term compared to debt, which has the inherent negative bias. So yeah, and it's, I think, We've all had that experience with people who were part of the community because we went to the same school, whatever it is, and we ended up outgrowing those people. It's just, it happens, right? That's life, right? And so such is, again, such is life. So cognizant of time too, I want to make sure that, you know, I think what we're really getting at in a lot of this, and this is one of the topics I said I wanted to cover before we even jumped on, is a lot of what you're focusing on, especially in the end of the book, which I'm not going to focus on as heavily because it's more about the actionable like steps people can take in an easy way. It's more so about your book is primarily about purpose, right? It's about life purpose and how to achieve that really. So I want to spend a little time on that because we kind of really kind of touched upon it in a lot of ways. But how about the importance of purpose and in particular for different types of people? I'm going to pick on business owners as being the the core of this, right? I I find a lot of them, the thought of giving up their business and retiring is an identity loss, right? And and a loss of purpose. Talk to me about how important purpose is and how it affects different people and how, how people can take steps to prevent that kind of gap in their lives from existing. Purpose is, I think, crucial for existence. I mean, I don't even want to like try to pair it back more than that. But like, when we don't have purpose, it becomes hard to exist. And like, that might seem like a big statement, but it's true. Even if when you think about just nature in general, when things don't have a purpose anymore, when they don't fit an ecosystem, they eventually cease to exist, right? Like if there's a food source that's no longer needed in an ecosystem, it will disappear. If you don't have purpose in your life, you will eventually disappear, right? You will fade out the joy, that spark in your eyes, that drive, it will disappear. And our lives are filled with major moments that shift that purpose. In our space, Jason, this as well as anybody, like retirement is one of those challenge spots, right? Like for business owners that then sell their business and move out of it or shut it down, that, that, you know, people often refer to that as like my baby, my kid, right? It's a part of me. It's my legacy. And when you remove that from somebody, it can take away a lot of their purpose. And if you're not intentional on replacing that purpose or actually defining what the value was or aspiration that that was fulfilling in your life purpose, which I I tend to find is actually the case, it isn't actually the company in a lot of cases. It is fulfilling some other need or aspiration. And that Mm -hmm. becomes the way in which you're achieving that purpose. That if you don't If you don't intentionally try to replace that, you end up in retirement, you end up without purpose. You actually see in the data that when people retire, overall, people that retire are happier than those that are still working. So then people are like, hey, retirement is this happy thing. But if you actually dive into that data, the average moves up because the majority of people shift up. However, there is a group that shifts down. You actually have more people who find themselves to be depressed in retirement than those that are working. And so you actually get an increase in the number of people that are depressed. And the main reasons for that, and there was a Harvard study that floated around this past week, is the fact that people feel that they lose their purpose and they lose their connection to others, which is another big one of that, which is why the community and purpose are so tied together, that Mm -hmm. our community becomes taken away from us, our purpose becomes taken away from us. But we don't have to let that happen. The reality is we have the ability to choose to not let that happen, but we can't just hope that it accidentally happens. We have to be purposeful on it. We've got to plan it out. We've got to also understand what is it that we are replacing. Is the purpose of your business, right, to provide money for you so your kids can thrive? Well, if that's the case, you might be okay when you retire if you feel like you've put them in that spot. If part of your business is named after you and that's your legacy and you don't have kids and you want that to be around after you're gone and you sell your business to somebody and they change the name, well, how are you going to replace that legacy then, Mm -hmm. right? Like that becomes a totally different thing. Your business was your legacy. Now that is gone. Now, how do you take the money and the time that you have to find legacy impact? And is that at your charity, right? So all of a sudden, maybe giving back or mentoring people can become part of that legacy where you were trying to get that from a name before. And you can swap those things out. But that's where understanding where is that business? Where is that purpose or meaning coming from today? Then how do we replace that if that was tied to your business, your work or your community before you retire? 
Excellent. And it's, it's interesting. I mean, the, um, again, it goes so back to the, so it's, it's, it's fascinating because I see this all the time and I prep people all the time and especially the business owners or anyone who's really spent most of their lives around their career and their career is their identity. In a lot of ways, it's the, I joke around the two retirement plans. It's the one I work on that's mathematical is the one they got to work on, which is how they're going to fill their time and find meaning in what they do with their time after they decide to retire. And that is, that is one that frankly should worry people more because it is one that can lead to a lot of depression and a lot of issues if you don't do that. And, and as for community, I'm going to also wrap this up with, with another comment of that old age homes often get a bad rap and some for some very merited reasons in, in life. But I time and time again, I've seen the isolated individual who lost a spouse, who can no longer take care of themselves, resist emphatically moving into an old age home, only to move into an old age home and suddenly be reinvigorated mm -hmm. because now they have community again. And it's, it's such an important, important view or like a great test or, or demonstration of how the loss of that and then the brief, the, the now creation of a new one can basically reinvigorate people. Yeah. I can close with a quick story around that one too, a personal one, which is, you know, my, one set of my grandparents lived in a continued care retirement community. That's what we call them here in the United States, the CCRC, mm -hmm. which is kind of freestanding living when you move in and all the way through kind of the long-term care hospice level care at the back end in this facility. And when my grandmother was alive, her and my grandfather had like a great community. They were constantly active doing things. And I would say that their quality of life was super, super high. And that was enabled by that community. Interesting thing, though, is after my grandmother passed away, my grandfather did not partake in any of that anymore and actually like deteriorated very quickly, which is not super uncommon when you have spouses at that age and one passes away. A lot of them lose meaning and, and connection quickly, too. But he really did. Like he didn't feel the same desire. He didn't interact as much. He just kind of pulled back into himself, which was kind of sad, but also beautiful in some ways to kind of experience and watch it. Excellent. So before we wrap up, what kind of final words of wisdom do you have for people? And uh, besides, you know, buying the book, which I will encourage when, when looking at thinking about their lives and, and their financial lives and their financial futures, what are the kind of the foundational steps you think that you're the, the kind of sage words you can give them? No pressure. Yeah, I'll <laughs> give two things that I kind of weave through what we said before. So the very first one is it's the setting and I call it aspirations. Like, who do you aspire to be? And that is different than a goal. Goals are mile markers along that way to your aspiration. So do you want to be somebody who is a great philanthropist? Do you want to be a great parent? Do you want to be a great creator of jobs? What is that thing that you aspire to be? I think it's really hard to get to all the other stuff if you have no notion of that whatsoever. Now, aspirations can change too. Like you don't have to be permanent on that. What I aspired to be in my 20s is not what I aspire to be now. And like, that's okay. But I do think spend some time on that. Like just sit, think by yourself and then write it down. I, I always challenge people to write these things down. It's different having to write down, like I aspire to be and then see it on paper and read it out loud and then tell somebody, right? Like do yeah. all those things. Then the last part of this is, right? If you do not feel freedom in your life today, right? You don't feel financial freedom. You don't feel freedom. What I want you to do, the first step is recognize that like you are worthy of having that feeling. And then number two, what is the one thing you can do that can move you along that path to finding freedom, like within the next 24 to 48 hours? I do a lot of coaching. And a lot of times when I have people list goals to me in coaching, I then ask them, what can you do today to move that forward? And if their answer is there's nothing I can do today to move it forward, I always tell them it's the wrong goal. Like if you can't do anything to action on it, you, that's a useless goal, right? Like if you have to be able to action on it. So if you don't feel that you have financial freedom today, what is one thing that you can do in the next 24 hours that moves you closer to having that feel? Excellent. Sage advice. Jamie, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Jason, thanks for having me on. Always appreciate talking to you and stay safe and healthy, my friend. You too. So that was Jamie Hopkins of uh, Carson. Hope you enjoyed that. And again, the book is Find Your Freedom, Financial Planning for Life on Purpose. And again, I highly encourage everyone to contemplate both reading that book, but also just deeply thinking about their purpose because everything comes from that in the end. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever it is you get your podcast. And until next time, take care. Thank you.
This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals, business owners, and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca. You can even ask Surrey, Alexa, or Google Home